Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor trained in trauma and addiction. The Asking Why podcast is for anyone on a journey of healing and restoration. If you are searching for answers to life's questions and want to learn more about root causes from a psychological and theological mix, this show is for you. In this podcast, myself and a co-host from Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness will interview guests on a wide range of topics in order to get down to the heart of the problems facing our world and understand why things happen and how to change the world and ourselves for the better. Want to learn more tips and tricks to living a healthy lifestyle? Visit us at Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to meet our staff or book a speaker, go to clintdaviscounseling.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe today. Okay, uh, welcome to Asking Why, episode 43. Uh, I'm your host, Clint Davis, and I'm very, very thankful to have Dr. Caroline Leaf. Um, she's an author of books like Switch on Your Brain, The Perfect You, and Think and Eat Yourself Smart. Dr. Leaf speaks all over the world on neuroscience and is a lover of Jesus. Uh, today, we're going to talk about her new book and podcast, Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess. Uh, I'm going to read you a little intro. Dr. Caroline Leaf is a communications pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist with a master's and PhD in communication pathologist, pathology. Um, since the early 1980s, she has researched the mind-brain connection, the nature of mental health, and the formation of memory. She was one of the first in her field to study how the brain can change neuroplasticity with the directed mind input. And so, yeah, I just, like I was telling you before we started the podcast, I've had several clients who love your books, who have gotten so much out of them. And as we're doing therapy together, you know, they're coming in saying, well, I read the same thing in Dr. Lee's book, or, or this is what she said. And, you know, this really helped me so much be able to take, you know, the kind of trauma work we were doing and have practical steps to applying it. So I'm just so thankful uh, to having you. So welcome. Thank you, Clint. It's lovely to join you. And I loved your background story that you shared with me and that I read a bit about you as well. So it's great how you've taken trauma and you've turned it into helping people. So it's really wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. It's, it's very encouraging. God is definitely good in, in taking beauty uh, or ashes and making beauty out of it, as, as I know that you know that. Um, so, yeah, so let's get started on the book. Um, for those who might know, not know who you are, um, can you tell a little bit about who you are and what brought you to kind of merging faith and neuropsychology? Sure. Well, that wasn't really my objective in the beginning because, you know, if you look at the word, what the word science means, science means, it comes from the word skura, which means knowledge. And so science and spirituality, for me, there was just like no distinction between them. They're just basically two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So right from day one, I, I, it, my, science has been my spiritual discovery. I'm a scientist, been one for 38 years. I still do clinical trials and research. We have a massive study running currently with nearly 35,000 people looking at mental health over this pandemic period and man, mind management. And I've been in this world of psychoneurobiology, which is mind brain body connection for nearly 38 years now, nearly four decades. Began back in South Africa in the 80s when they didn't believe that the brain could change. So mm -hmm. that was the going philosophy in the 80s. And I was sitting in one of my neurology lectures and neuroscience lectures, and the professors were going on about how we put a trait of patients to compensate and, you know, with clinical neuroscience, which is what I was being trained to do. And I thought, well, how, you know, how can you just teach someone to compensate? It just didn't quite ring true. So I always believed that, you know, that you, you if we, we are changing all the time, then our brain must be changing. And that concept of comp of just teaching someone to compensate is kind of negative because it means that there's that you you can't really change. You just got to work your way around the mm -hmm. situation. And so I said that I don't believe that that can be accurate because we as humans are always changing. We're having different experiences all the time. And our mind is not the brain. The mind is showing up in the brain. And in the 80s, that concept was very much accepted, mind and brain being separate. And so if the mind is showing up in the brain and the mind is always changing, that means the brain's got to change to accommodate the mind changes. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, do some research. And I started working with people with traumatic brain injuries because that was the most difficult kind of um, place to start because there was hardly any research. And they didn't research it because, well, if your brain's damaged, what's the point of researching? Right. You know, what <laughs> So I, that's where I started and I showed in a very short time with different patients that, you know, if you direct your mind, if you, if you manage your mind, if you capture those thoughts and renew the mind, if you, if you drive your mind and manage it, you can actually change the messy mind 
into something healthier and you can change the structure of the brain and that's neuroplasticity so in the 80s that was one of some of the first research that i did on neuroplasticity in my field by the 90s it was accepted fast forward to today people talk about neuroplasticity all the time which is the fact that the brain can change mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is that the brain can't change on its own right and what changes the brain and that's really been key in my work is okay yeah but all these patients working with your dementias and chronic traumatic encephalopathy from sports damage and learning disabilities and autism and sexual trauma and war trauma how do i help them understand how to get the wise mind connected with the messy mind and change the structure of the brain in a healthy direction and hence the body so that's been my search for all these years and i'm still searching and still finding new things all the time absolutely yeah i think it's I, when i tell people that you know we didn't get the diagnosis for ptsd until 1984 it's like, you, you know, you said the 80s, which for us seems like a long time ago, but in the world of like human beings, it's so short. And so it's like, oh my gosh, and we're in this amazing time right now where we're getting to see the brain and study the brain and understand the brain. Um, and kind of like you're saying, we have to go back and kind of deconstruct some of the things we thought about humanity. But it's also giving us a beautiful lens, um, in my opinion, to treating root causes. And I love and uh in your book on page 18, um, it says, uh, gathering information without processing and applying it is counter to how mind works and how the brain is structured and has a del uh, deleterious effect on your mental and physical well-being, creating a mental mess in the mind and physical mess in the body. And so that mind-body connection, right, that's something that I think we also have completely missed is that whatever we're thinking and feeling and experiencing and believing is also affecting our physical body. And so Absolutely. I love that's how you connect the dots on those. Yeah, that's such a key component. And even though um, it's basically the psychoneurobiology link, it's actually been around for 150, well, it's been around forever. Right. Like the ancient texts, you can go back to the ancient texts in, in both scientific and spiritual senses and cross religions. And you'll see that the concept of mind and the physical have always been something that's separate and the mind being the thing that drives the physical. Then we entered into the scientific era and we fast forward to the last 40 years and we've had a very, very interesting paradoxical thing happening. As we've advanced with brain science and neuroscience and learning more about the human brain, and for those of you that are listening, I'm holding up a human brain in a skull. It's a model, not a real one. Um, advanced to where we are now. In the last 40 years, we've become so consumed with neuroscience, which is a good thing mm -hmm. because you want to learn that. But it's a bad thing, too, because we've become neuro-reductionistic. So the general philosophy of humanity has been almost reduced down to the physical aspects to the point where Di where, some, where, where a human experience is now diagnosed as an illness, mm -hmm. adverse human experience, and, and emotions are seen as illnesses, and, and you know, that's just not even science. If you really analyze and look at all the studies that have been done and all the research that's been done for the last 40 years, and in fact the last 150, that we see that it's actually, you know, it's not a dead person that you do research on, it's an alive person, and that yeah. alive person has experienced some, uh, something, and that aliveness is your mind. So we've got to consider the aspect of mind and how it changes the body because the mind drives the body. You know, and that's really critical. And you mentioned earlier on about the diagnosis of PTSD being identified in 1984. I remember sitting in another lecture and I had I, I had an incredible did an incredible degree. It was an experimental degree where they had they blended medicine and neuroscience and neurology and and communication pathology and they put a seven-year degree into four years and we were so intensively trained in hospital in clinics in but the, and it was not a nightmarish in terms of time but in terms of helping me understand more about mind it was incredible and one of my other lectures we we had one of these professors saying oh gosh with the dsm we're now going to have all these labels mm -hmm. and that's good and and I remember him distinctly saying, fast forward 30 years, and we're going to have a problem with people being overlabeled and creating predictive patterns, and we're going to start losing our humanity. And it wasn't those exact words, but I'll never forget the context of it. And now 30, you know, 38 years later, that has happened. So when someone is PTSD is real, but it's not a it's not a disease. Right. It's basically a warning signal that there's something going on that you said earlier on as well we have to track down to the root you're showing up with those traumatic responses because of something and that's the the route that we need to go versus oh you have a clinical diagnosis of ptsd you have a 
DSM-5 or ICD labeled brain, you have a label, you have a brain disease, but that's not going to help you because if you just get a label and then if you ask, well, why have I got that? Then they'll say those are the symptoms. And then you say, but the symptoms are what I gave you. Why do I have those symptoms? Because you have PTSD. Why do I have PTSD? Because it's those symptoms. Yeah, it's you, a not, cyclical problem. It's a tautology. It's a tautology. It's going in circle, circular problem. So you can't do that. You have to say, okay, PTSD is the manifestation. It's the signal. It's the name of the signal. Why? What is it? What does it yeah. look like? And where does it come from? You know, and that's not really the philosophy that's dominating our current mental health movement. I know a lot of people like yourself and myself and a lot of the people I work with are challenging that yep. paradigm. But the dominant paradigm is diagnose, label, and medicate. Yeah, I mean, that's that's why we call it asking why. Because, you know, my biggest thing is I was listening to podcasts the last, you know, three or four years heavily would there be great subjects and great, you know, symptoms and great, like, here's what you do. And I was always like, well, why, you know, like, and especially during COVID and the pandemic and black lives matter movement and all these things, I kept the same thing. It's like, well, why, why are these problems? Why are, why are people triggered? Why, why is this the, the system we find ourselves in? And I, I think you do a beautiful job of, of talking about that. Um, you talk about weighing the cost and it says the current mental health care system has largely reduced the source of human pain and suffering to newer psychiatric brain diseases with symptoms that need to be suppressed with medication or conditioning of our thoughts and our behaviors. Um, and before that, you know, it's talking about the increase in medication, you know, and how much, I mean, I know so many doctors um, who are not psychiatrists, MDs, who can just prescribe whatever because you say, I have anxiety. Um, and we have doctors in our practice, and I love that we partner because then they'll ask the why questions and they'll go down to the root and then they'll send them to therapy. But you're so right. We we are just treating symptoms and never getting back down to the to the root problem. And then we label people with, like you said, PTSD. And it's hard. I mean, I, as a veteran myself, you know, I, I had PTSD and have PTSD. I guess you, you always have some of the triggers. Um, but the reality is, is that, yeah, when you look at it like a disease, you don't want to take it on. So then a lot of times you don't get help. But if somebody can say, you know, I always say your, your, um, your symptoms are, are a normal response to an abnormal situation. And you say yeah. that, I think you said that in here at one point, like, nothing. Yeah, so, sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead. So, no, it's true that, that anything that the way you show up is because of circumstances, whatever you've gone through. We don't just show up because of something. So whatever, you know, if you're showing up with a trauma response and it's the different trauma responses and, and PTSD kind of fall, falls into sort of a description of a combination of trauma responses, as you know. But that's not who you are. That's not a brain disease. That doesn't right. mean you have a damaged brain it certainly means that your brain's a mess in a certain yeah. sense because that um, that experience was processed into your brain it was a messy experience so it's good by by default it's going to be making a messy it's going to make a mess in the brain and, and i use these toxic trees to show people because that's what an experience becomes an experience a healthy experience becomes a protein tree-like structure in the brain but when it's a toxic experience mm -hmm toxic version of that so all the proteins and neurochemistry and everything to do with the neurophysiology is all wrong but it's there it's real it's it's it's, it's a real thing but like we were talking about if you having in in as a veteran you would have gone through various experiences so there's the root those are the experiences as you were experiencing them how did you experience them with your mind mm -hmm. so here you are alive uh, clint in the situation and all the situations that you were in and i hope i'm not triggering you by oh saying, no you're good okay um, but the, the situations that you were in the environment, you process that because that's what we do as humans. You can't not. That's what you were doing. So everything was being processed through your mind, showed up in your brain. And as that experience, which is that gravitational field and electromagnetic light forces, which is all your thinking, feeling and choosing, all mixed into these energy components, show up in your brain. And as soon as that combination happens, as soon as the experience gets into your brain, the brain responds. So the brain is a responder and it responds in incredibly complex ways, neurochemically, electromagnetically, genetically. And that experience is then turned from an energy field through that, that response of the brain into protein structures that, that vibrate the content of the experience, the emotions, the data, what happened, all of it are stored in vibrations inside these branches. So if it's healthy, it's okay. But if it's a toxic experience, it's going to be toxic. 
So the root is what you experience. And as you're experiencing it, the way that our, our neurophysiology works, it's unreal that as you're going through the, as you're processing the experience in the way I've described and building it into your brain in these protein tree-like structures, you first build the root. So like any, any tree, seeds planted, the root grows. And as soon as it happens simultaneously, it's, it speeds 400 billion actions per second. You process that in a distorted way because it's a distorted experience and you grow what we call the branch the branch memory. So those are the root memories, which is the story, the origin, the source. That's the processing of it. And this is the interpretation. Mm -hmm. And this is interpretation is how you uniquely think, feel and choose about that situation. And it's all distorted. So this whole thing becomes this distorted toxic thought. So like a tree has roots and branches. So does a thought thought trees, you talk about thought trees in neuroscience, have roots and branches, the roots being the source, the interpretation being the inter the, the, sorry, the branches being the interpretation. This collectively is how they show up. So when you have someone coming to therapy, or you take your own experiences, the, the, the triggers will activate these, and that will manifest in four ways. And those four ways are your emotions, like depression, anxiety, whatever, behaviors like panic attack, doing whatever, um, your body symptoms, maybe GI symptoms, heart palpitations, cardiac issues, autoimmune, whatever, and then also in perspective, like I can't do this, life sucks, that kind of thing. So yeah. those are four, four types of signals that these will manifest in. So we can look at those signals and we can track back to the roots. And so instead of just saying you have PTSD, you need to go on medication because you're going to get triggered and you're going to, um, you know, you have a maybe an outburst or something that makes other people uncomfortable you know or something like that so let's kind of you, you know what happens with army vets i've interviewed so many yeah i mean they, they're injecting antipsychotics into their spine spinal cord to literally control and basically control behavior responses meanwhile those behavioral responses are one of the signals of something that's going on so any kind of medication for is not going to fix this right it's simply going to numb the process and numb the symptoms for a season, but it's still there. So I always explain it, and you probably have done the same thing. It's like you go and put, you know, you have weeds in your garden. If you just chop the head off, you don't pull them on properly, the weed keeps growing back. That's and that's absolutely. what the current system is the diagnosis and the label initially gives you a sense of peace. Okay, um, I, it's acknowledged, there's a label to it, there's a, but, but now you've got a disease label. So I'm thinking there's something so wrong with this. Why should an experience that you have gone through become a disease mm -hmm. it's not a disease. you don't need what you've gone through as a vet to be validated by a disease label we need to hear your story and so therefore the diagnosis and the label doesn't help and the research shows that it doesn't help it's made things worse on a good side it's helped us to talk about it more, which we weren't doing so it's good that that's the good side the negative side is that it's, it's actually created more of a problem because the labeling has stopped that's kind of where it stops because now you are this person with this issue and you have a mental health disease mm -hmm. you don't have a disease you have a response well I, and i think <laughs> I, I think i think it's so beautiful dr leaf because i think part of the problem with it on the other side is you're right like sometimes people get that label like oh i have ocd or i have adhd and and they're like oh finally an answer to what's wrong with me and and you're right instantly there's a little relief but then when no one takes them through what we just talked about and reduces that shame and says your identity is not in this, let's figure out how and why this happened to you and why you're struggling with these symptoms, then yes, it, it that, that little bit of relief gets compounded and then there's a lot of shame and a lot of identifying in that. And I find with young people, yeah, the negative thoughts, what I find is that with young people, especially today, and what I like about your book is it gives – um, and we'll talk about the neurocycle in a second, but it, it gives you um, a little personal responsibility in a sense that you do have some control over your thought life and some ability to to practice and get your cognition going in the right direction, get your neuro pathways formed in, in the right way. It's going to take work and it's going to take support, but you can do it. And I, because I find that in the culture that we have now, sometimes when you give a label, what happens is, is that uh, young adults, young teenagers, they go, oh, well... I'm this. And so therefore, you know, I can't do anything else. You know, it's almost like we did a podcast on the Enneagram last week. You know, it's when people are like, well, I'm a one. And so you know how I am. And it's like, no, you're not, you're not set in stone. No, you are. That's a, that, a huge part of the work when I was practicing was to 
work on people's identity because that people don't really understand identity. We know what it is, but we don't know what it is. You know, we know instinctively that there's something I can do that no one else can do, but we don't quite know how to manifest that or to, you know, and it's half coming out and it half isn't, but that's why I think sometimes those, those personality profiles can do more damage than good because you, you're not a category. You know, you are your own unique person. And if you've been categorized as an X and you've gone through trauma, which all of us do go through, as you and I both know, yeah. have to be informed trauma is with us whether you like it or not big <laughs> Amen. daily the big stuff the small stuff you know we say on a scale from one to ten you may not have as many ten tens in your life which are the traumas that are really bad big but teeth. you still have a multitude of the ones twos threes and fours yep. and that those are traumas that we, we kind of ignore but the, each of those experiences each experience is becoming this. This is what trauma looks like in the brain. Mm -hmm. And not only is it in the brain in this format, but the brain then immediately sends a message to every cell of the body or the rest of the cells. And there's 37 to 100 trillion and tells, and this this is stored in our gene, in our gene code. So it changes our gene code in every, every cell. And that's why EMDR works because EMDR, for example, is basically pulling this memory out of the cells. So when we, when we experience anything adverse or good experiences we build it as a network in the brain a tree made of proteins and chemicals we build it as a change in our dna in every cell and we build it as gravitational and electromagnetic fields in our mind which basically vibrate all the way through us so it's in three places mm. and that takes time to stabilize so therefore it's going to take time to destabilize and to and to reconstruct and decon to deconstruct and reconstruct and that's what we should be doing more of and I know you know about sort of things like cognitive behavioral therapy and all that kind of thing. Those are, are techniques, but they don't fix the problem either. Oh, man. I'm so glad of, you're saying that. That's the same kind of concept as taking a drug, although it's a lot better than taking a drug. Absolutely. You but you can't just take this thought, say this is the wrong thought, which is true, and I need to replace it, which is true, but you can't actually just replace it. You have to reconceptualize it. You have to deconstruct it and reconstruct it. You have to take the root out of the garden. Mm -hmm. and we upend it so that the, the roots can actually die so that this can convert into that version and you can't change what's happened to you i mean you can talk about your experience as a vet um you can you can talk about it it's, happened, it, it's never going to go away right but you you have reconceptualized how you are managing it yeah so integrated you've, this you yeah you've changed it into something that's health still make you cry yep. still make you sad you can still be triggered but you've changed it You've reconceptualized, and that's so different to CBT. CBT is just that's bad replaced with that. You can't just replace. You have to reconceptualize. Right, and that works in the moment. Right, it works. Yeah. It works in the moment for a second until you're in yeah. any other situation. It's a support technique. I always talk about CBT and those things because they really some of the techniques are fantastic but if you don't use them in the right way they won't work for you they won't be sustainable they'll they're, they're just a constant band-aid on the wound yep. you know, one, one of the vets that i inter interviewed that i interviewed a few times he always talks about you can't put a band-aid on a bullet, bullet wound yep. and that's what medication and cbt and techniques that you're know, just saying standing up and saying five gratitude statements there's nothing wrong with the gratitude statements there's nothing wrong with, the, with an actual CBT technique. But if you don't use them properly, all you're doing is slapping the bandaid on the bullet wound. You know, and that's not going to be sustainable. Yeah, in the that, long run. that's so good. Yeah, one of I use bandaid over bullet holes all the time. And one of the I, I got a vet, must be a vet thing because every vet I've spoken to says that. So I think it's like such an amazing example. You know, it is. But, you know, and the same thing with like time heals all wounds. You know, it's, oh, it's no time. Yeah. Time is not going to heal that wound. Getting in there and no, cleaning no, no, no. it out. Right. And, and cleaning it and looking at it and, and not letting it fester is going to, going to heal it. Always damage there, no matter what time period your body goes through, whatever that bullet wound will always leave scar tissue. So it never goes away. It just changes. And that's a, that I did an a, a Instagram live the other day where I was talking about how grief in different, and I use three different bottles. Grief stays the same. So, and I use a little stone. And so the grief never changes, but the space around the grief increases. Mm. So time doesn't heal. Time doesn't shrink the grief. Time doesn't, time does not heal. Time simply creates space yep. so that you can actually manage more effectively. So yeah. There's so many little quips we throw out there that, that are aren't not true. Grief. No, and they actually can be quite damaging when someone's in a state of grief or in a state of being triggered by a PTSD event or something. Definitely. Yeah. I love the, uh, the box analogy with grief with the ball in the middle and the ball gets smaller 
but you know the trigger is still the same and so no matter what when it hits that trigger it's going to feel the same way that it used to you know even if it's been 10 years but it might hit it less often exactly and think of it even differently the the ball doesn't get actually get smaller but the space around it gets bigger because what happened chain that's always there what happened but our space to manage it increases over time i actually like that better i'm gonna steal that now yeah, it's it's really that's scientifically accurate because it never will this this will be converted, but the memory of it because this is a memory inside thoughts. So that's a thought, and a thought's made of memories. So memories are the detail, the little branches are all the memories. The, those are the root branches. Those are the interpretation branches. So essentially, what's happening here is that this has got a lot of information, a lot of data, and as you deconstruct this and reconstruct it into something healthy, it doesn't have the same power it had before, but you can still recall as much of the detail as you des- desire, but it's still there. Mm-hmm. What happened to you will never go away. It's there. It's, it's in your gravitational field. It's in your body, but it's different. So you can't change what's always, you can't change what's happened to you, but you can change what's in you, mm-hmm. which is how it plays out in the future. And Absolutely. that's where the concept, it doesn't get smaller over time. It just gets you get more space i mean you have more space it means you have more m- m- ways of managing the triggers and more ways of recognizing what i do that because of i'm not it, so it shifts from i am x depression or whatever like in my most recent clinical trial i give the example in this book at some of the subjects that came in at the beginning of the trial that were in such a bad way and they would say things like i am depression now you can't be depression you can't even have depression because depression is not an it like cancer or something. You can experience depression because it is an emotional warning signal. But they would shift from saying I am depression to, oh, no, I'm not depression. I am depressed because of, and that's key. Absolutely. That's beautiful. Yeah, they have. we have to help people get to those root causes. And I think, I think that's where Christianity comes in. Um, and, you know, even moving past the thought into the belief, and, you know, they're similar – but what do you what do you believe about God, about other people, and about yourself? You know, and that and these roots that we really need to get people to. I'm very spiritual, um, but I do believe that we mustn't define what that looks like for everyone else. I think it's a very personal thing. I think it's really important. But as spiritual beings, you can't get away with it that we're not spiritual. So our mind is the spiritual part of us. From the research I've done, from the ancient texts that I've that I've looked at and, and historians, to, to, spoken to historians and historical science and that kind of thing, looking at all the theory of science, if you look at all of that concept, mind is your spiritual nature. Mm-hmm brain and body are your physical nature so your brain and your body and i'm holding up a model of the body now and um, your brain and body are in the theory that i've developed and the kind of field that i'm moving psycho neurobiology the brain and body are looked at as being about one percent of who you are as a human one to ten percent maximum so what's the other 90 to 99 percent it's the mind so i use the mind collectively for this concept of spirit and soul because that's what we i see most in the science and most in the ancient going in the ancient text going back 150 years and before so mind is a beautiful collective word for that huge part of us you and i are alive because of our mind is still working to our brain and our body if we had a dead person sitting next to us we they wouldn't be able to do anything so i could put a QEEG on you and me and we'd get a tremendous response in the brain from this conversation. We'd get a lot of coherence and a lot of oxygen flow that we would pick up with other ways. And so, But the dead person, there would be no response. And that's the difference between mind and brain and difference and the importance of spirituality and the importance of recognizing and understanding that I have this incredible ability to, to respond to life, to control that response and to change the structure of my brain and my body and to drive that in a direction that is going to be doing something in the world because it's not about me it's about me me in the world it's about us in the world the impact that we have which is very spiritual Mm -hmm. after the biblical text plus any if you look at any religious text the impact of you on the world is a vital component and therefore love becomes your guiding force and if we look scientifically at what love is we can see that our brain and body, there's no wiring in the physical brain and body for anything that doesn't help the brain and body survive. So we we aren't designed with stuff that's going to kill us. We are to or make us not survive. Everything in the body and brain are meant to work. 
when they don't work, it's because of something that's happened, whether it's something that you've been exposed to, or it's an accident, or it's a trauma, or the physical and um, experience all change the brain and the body. But the core basic foundation is the brain and body are designed to work for you. We call that the wide, full of the nature of the brain and the body. And in the mind, which is working, driving and, and energizing the brain and the body, the spiritual force is, is a driven, is what we call the optimism bias, also, also wide, full of. So we as humans are all in a whole design on a from a gravitational field to electromagnetics to to the actual physical structure and the biology of the brain and the body are all wired for survival and survival is love because love is something that is growing it's it's um, energetic it's a force that gives and keeps giving and it keeps um keeps multiplying in a positive way and it's it brings a sense of peace in the midst of chaos and all that stuff that we know so we see as scientists that when there's any kind of disruption to that nature that love nature in the brain and the body our mind brain and body are drawn to that to fix it so a very simple example would be covid virus it's a virus it invades the body gets into the brain, it gets into the body, and it affects our lungs, and so on. we all know that. We know it's a protein, it's a physical thing. And so what does the immune system do? It recognizes that this is disturbing a wide full of nature. It's threatening survival. So it sends out T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes and starts to fight and so on, and it fights this force, this, I mean, this real structure. Now, a thought is also made of proteins, and people don't realize this. Your mind is this energetic force that actually builds protein structures inside mm -hmm. of your body. So as real as the COVID virus is, so is that toxic trauma you've gone through. Right. Or gone through all the traumas you've gone through, or that toxic experience, whether it's a huge one or whether it's a smaller one, like a horrible post on Instagram or something, or a comment, someone commenting and upsetting you, or arguments amongst loved ones that like not a massive thing, but it's enough to make you feel upset or whatever. To in, to to something that you've experienced, which would be a number ten as a as a um, as a vet. So, in other words, that that whole experience is inside of us. It's so real. So, as soon as we have an experience like that, your brain and body's immune system don't just respond to the COVID virus or the the, the blister on your hand or the surgery or the uh, the antibody that I mean, the not the antibody, the biological organism that got in your body and get and that you need antibiotics for. It doesn't just respond to those. It also responds to your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And so you have an immune response to this. And we see that immune response in people's homocysteine levels, for example, increasing and cortisol levels rising. And oh, yeah. DHEA, DHEA dropping and things like prolactin, which is a hormone that you find in both men and women. Um, and it's, it's, it's what we, we see more and more research showing that it is, it is a proxy for mental health. And so we see that. We see changes in the brain. I use QEEG in my research. We see changes in the DNA, in the telomeres, which are the ends of chromosomes, which influence... Um, your cells producing cells of which we make a million every second mm -hmm. those make up our, every organ of our body so the cells you're making now are making up your body and so we're remaking our brain and body all the time and the quality of those cells are based on the quality of the telomeres are based on the quality of the dha cortisol ratio based on the homocysteine levels and when everything lines up and those are just a few things then we build healthy cells yep how do we do that? How do we keep them healthy? We have to be managing our mind. We have to recognize life is filled with adversity. It's not, it's it's okay to be a mess. This is absolutely key. That's why I said cleaning up the mental mess. It's okay to be a mess. If you've gone through something and you're a mess, that's a very normal response. Give yourself permission, embrace it, but now fix it. Exactly. So in a world that's saying, if messiness if you get messy, like have emotions that are you know depressed, you're depressed or whatever. That's an illness. That's something wrong with you. No, it's not something wrong with you. It is a response and a warning. That whole collective thing is your response. And it's the war emotions of the warning signals and your body symptoms and so on. As I mentioned earlier, these, these are warning signals, not diseases in response to what you're going through. And they're real. So your body's, your brain, mind and body are sending you signals to say, hey, pay attention. Let me make your heart sore. Your heart's getting sore. You you get some autoimmune thing, or you have this incredible um, you flatten, uh, you freeze, and you have a freeze response, or your body just like packs up on you, or in a in a moment you have a major panic attack, and or you um, whatever you you your life sucks. You know you, that's what you, your perspective is. Life sucks, or whatever it may be. So you get these that that is t all of your mind, brain, and body 
I don't know how to even say this. It's so important for people to understand that when all those things overwhelm all that, instead of saying, oh my gosh, I've got a brain disease. There's something wrong with me. I'm whatever. Say, no, stand back and actually observe yourself and say, that's okay. That's mm -hmm. okay, Clint. It's okay, Caroline. It's, it's okay to be a mess. This is not who you are. This is not your identity. You buy it for love. You have an optimism bias. That's right. All you do now is your mind, brain, and body are giving you flashlights, warning signals, alarm bells to say, hey, pay attention. Is something going on? So if you run towards instead of run away from those, you actually then go to find the root. And that philosophy is not what we in general are exposed to today. No, definitely so, not. Our, I mean, the philosophy that's, that's ruling the day right now is, you know, that your behavior is is how you get worth and value and and what you what you do in life and your successes and your ability to hold it together or your ability to push through or your ability to do anything external you know it dictates your internal worth and value and that's one of our you know kind of messages here at Clint Davis counseling is like you're nothing external is going to change that internal state right you're worthy and valuable because you're a human and the one thing i always say to clients i'm like you know there's one thing you have to do to have worth and value and they say what and i say breathe or you have to be alive. Yeah. Like that's it. If you're breathing and you're alive, you have intrinsic worth and value. And I think what you're saying is so, I love that you put the scientific um, lens on it because when we're living in the way, right, the way in which is best and most optimal for us, that's thriving for us, things go well. When we're, exactly. you know, uh, when we're holding these thoughts captive, not just saying that we're doing it, but actually doing it. Right. And I love that you give us kind of a, a step to doing that. So it's not enough to be a Christian and say, oh, yeah, Paul says do this. And so I, you know, I, I read this little scripture in this quote. It's are you actually practically do you know that you there's a way to actually do that? Like, it's not just a thing he said. It's actually a thing you can do. And when you do it, it affects your neurochemistry. It affects your body. It affects your soul. We saw we saw people that were managing their minds, like in my clinical trial, we saw people the um, biological age, which is the age of your organs and your body. And you want that to match or be less than your actual age. So it's great if you if your X age and your biological is younger. That means you're really doing well, but you definitely don't want it to be older. And what we found is that to show the impact of, of what you you know what we've been discussing, mind on, on brain and body, when you um, aren't managing your mind, when you're not giving yourself permission to be a mess, when you are using scripture like a band-aid or a, a magic potion, um, when you are using God as a genie, when you are just not dealing with your stuff and you just think about quote a scripture or a great a concept or something that's going to go away, we, when you do that, your body suffers terribly and those telomeres will not function well and all those other things, you know, your hormones and your heart, and everything just works against you. So what we saw is that some of our subjects at the beginning of the clinical trial, their biological age was up to 30, 35 years older than the actual chronological mm. age. So you imagine if you're 30 and your body's a 60 year old, a sickly one, you're vulnerable to disease, you're Definitely. vulnerable to all kinds of stuff, you're vulnerable to dying young. And that's what we see, we're in an era, not just the COVID pandemic, but we're in an era which hit us, the, the results actually came out in a study to 1996 to 2014, like nearly a 20 year long study, that's been tracking this trend and that's showing that people are actually not living longer people are dying younger yeah gen z are going to die up to 8 to 25 years younger than um than my generation and my parents generation yeah they'll be surprised if they make it to 65 right. or 75 because of the toxic stress yeah. that they're carrying since they were yeah. eight years old exactly which is decreasing the um increasing the vulnerability of the body so it's not overnight yes. You have one experience, you don't manage it, you get cancer. It doesn't work like that. It's accumulating. Mm -hmm. It's aggregating. It aggregates in your body. So vulnerability continues to increase without mind management. And part of increasing the vulnerability of your body is not allowing yourself to process. And this is what I've seen. I work in, I train physicians. I train therapists, counselors. I work in neuroscience conferences. I work, I work around the world in different environments, different religions. And almost every weekend, I'm in a church somewhere. So I'm talking about humanity. I reach the broad spectrum of humanity. And I can tell you something now that there is an absolute, um, there's, there's this this, this in, inherent thing that people think that they've got to kind of hide their emotions mm -hmm. and not deal with their, you know, the shut it down. But it, sh and shut them down. But that's like the worst thing that you can do. Yes. Because you can't just, it, that they don't go away. 
they are volcanic in nature. They're real. That's how I try to paint the picture. These are real protein things. They're causing brain damage. So until you deal with them, which is a whole deconstruction, reconstruction process, it's just not going to bode well for the person. So we see this. We see this happening that people are dying 8 to 25 years younger from preventable lifestyle issues. And it's coming from preventable stuff. Mm-hmm. People are dying preventable stuff. It's insane in this day of modern technology and medicine that people are dying up to 25 years younger. And those with a, a, a med- mental health label, they are moving more to the 20, 25 years dying earlier range than sort of the eight year. And the, the age group being most struck down are, the, are 24 to 85. Now I'm not, I'm 65. Now I'm not just trying to paint a picture of bloom. I'm painting a picture that doesn't have to look like this. Right. That we are seeing we are seeing after 20 years of research, we are seeing that what we've been doing is, is not working. And what have we been doing? Ignoring the humanity of Absolutely. the story. It's not about the diagnosis. It's about your story and how we're going to manage your story. Absolutely. Yeah. I think um, one of the things I'm working on is kind of a trauma informed um, clinical uh, lens discipleship model so that we can get to, you know, I heard you speak with somebody else. I was listening to a podcast and they were saying that, you know, they, they get nervous in sharing their story and should they share their thoughts and their feelings and these things. And, you know, people will say, well, I don't know if I know anybody or I might know one person that I can share those things with. And that's what makes me so sad is that we, we, the other, like you talked about the individual and the culture and it's both, right? It's like, we need people and we need ourselves to be right and think rightly. But that means we need safe trauma-informed Christians and people around us who can listen to our stories and hold our stories and share their stories with us like we've done in order to be able to share those things and get those things out. And what always happens is nine times out of 10, the person's like, Oh, me too. Or I'm struggling with that too. Or like that because everyone is struggling. I mean, Clint, there isn't one person on this. If you're alive and human, which you are, you, you're battling, you're a mess. So am I. We all are. The difference is, are you managing your mess? It's mm-hmm. okay to be a mess. God has accommodated for that that in our in our neurobiology, in our psychoneurobiology. It's evidence. Look at Jesus in the garden. Jesus was a complete mess in the garden just before Jesus was crucified. I'd be a mess too. So would you. I mean, there was this, this huge thing that Jesus cried out to God, take this from me. We allow to do that. Yeah, That's what so good. we supposed to but the, the the word of faith movement and these and the wellness movement and they're doing the same thing religious laws and wellness laws and they all have good intentions but it's all hey that's a bad emotion don't speak that emotion don't say how you feel it doesn't go away if you don't say how you feel you don't get it out of those in. you know these you you have got permission give yourself permission to embrace what you're going through yes. and speak about it absolutely get it out don't stay there. What a lot of people do is they can do that. Then they get stuck there. It's not a um, swamp. You don't get stuck there. It's not a quagmire. What you're supposed to do is progress through, which is what happened to Jesus in the garden. There were stages that took time. And then it got worse before it got better. The treatment effect. I talk about that in the book. And I even show you graphs of the treatment effect. When oh, you yeah. Start yeah. If, you, if you're listening to this, you should definitely get the book, uh, get the hardcover and look at the, um, she's got some really beautiful graph, uh, color graphs. And they really help you see how the brain works and the different MRIs and the different transitions. And it's really awesome. It, it helps a lot to see that because as you are getting rid of these things, you know, when you work with a client, that when they start seeing the suppressed trauma, like you said yourself, you started off this podcast saying that you had terrible trauma in childhood. I'm sure when you started seeing that, you felt even more depressed and more anxious and more upset, but it's different. It's a different kind of, it's, it's a, it's a normal, it's a normal response because you're seeing that should never have happened to you. Right. Those things you should never have gone through. So, and, but you have to see them in order to feel them to heal. You have to go through them and that's the treatment effect. So it gets worse before it gets better, but people are frightened of that. And people Terrified. are in the religious community or the wellness community. It's, oh, you're not doing something right. You're not, you know, you're not taking responsibility or you're just getting stuck. No, I have had patients that have gone from suppression to complete collapse to, to functioning, to non-functioning, to functioning, to non-functioning. And eventually get into a place of peace in the midst of chaos. And that's very normal. All of us need to learn how to live in peace in the midst of chaos. You're never going to not have depression and anxiety. It's just going to range on a scale. Sometimes it's at a one, which is not which is not so bad. Sometimes it's at a ten, where it's debilitating. But it's still not a disease. It's just your body telling you to pay attention. Absolutely. Your mind, your mind brain, and body telling you to pay attention. 
Yeah, I'd say I'd say it's God pointing you to wanting to unlearn something or learn something new. You know, a lot of you know, deconstruct and reconstruct into something healthy. Yep. And you need your wise mind to do that. And at the core of your being is your wise mind, which is this wide full of nature, and it's made in God's image. So that's the wide full of nature, and that's what drives us. That's that's you know, think I always say this since in churches and people. It, I don't know if this, if you've heard this sort of, you would have heard it. Okay, so they say the devil made me do it, or you know, there's evil in mankind, and you've got to suppress that evil. And you know, there's a lot of misinterpretation of Paul's writings, a lot, and a lot of incorrect sort of literal stuff. Meanwhile, if you really read the scriptures and go read what Jesus said, you'll see that actually, because of free will, you're going to make a mess. It's inevitable. Every day you are going to make a mess, and the levels often one to ten. Little messes to big messes. And if you pretend they don't exist or if you think you are terrible and going to guilt of condemnation about those, you're going to traumatize yourself daily. Mm. Meanwhile, say, okay, I did it again. Let me now own that. Let me see why. That's not who I am. I'm doing that because of a trauma. There's something going on that is co- that is resulting in these kind of behaviors coming up. When you do that kind of work, that's the wise mind telling you, hey, you made in God's image, you connected to the spirit of God, that the core of who you are is wisdom, that is who you are. So this behavior pattern and emotions and so on that are disruptive to your functioning or your relationships aren't you, it is basically a result of something. So your wise mind, which is always operating in perfection, that's why I wrote the book, The Perfect You, is actually can dominate. And you've got to, so I teach people all my work, for cleaning up your mental mess, I talk about getting the wise mind, which is the core for you, are your wide full of nature, to talk to the messy mind and be friends with the messy mind. It's okay because in messiness, we repair and grow. You cannot grow if you don't mess up first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we when uh, I'm a sex addiction therapist, we talk about the shadow self a lot in, in that world, and it's the same thing. It's like you have to, you have to see it and look at it. Um, the other analogy I love is, uh, you know, with all of our pain, all of our traumas, that, you know, it's, it's this dragon, you know, that we have to face. And yeah. we can either face it in its lair, trapped in a cave where we might where, where we might get the gold, or we can wait till it comes out flying around blowing fire on us. One way or another, we're going to have to fight it, you know, and it's going to be scary. But either way, you know, that dragon is going to have to be looked at to change. It's the only way. It's the only way. You can't suppress it. You can't go numb the dragon with an opioid or a sedative every five minutes. You have to actually do something about the dragon. Absolutely. And also- no one can do it for you. There's also a lot of incorrect sort of teaching, I think, around it, especially in the churches. I've seen this a lot. That, um, and and also in, in the in the world of therapy and counseling and coaching, where you think you can fix someone, no one can fix anyone. You know, as you know, the therapist gets to the root, and the counselor, whereas the coach is helping someone to achieve, you know, to sort of get through and be more see another things from another perspective. And if we, we, but you can't fix someone. If you, as a therapist, coach, parent, leader, whatever, feel that you can fix someone or get frustrated when you try and change someone, you are causing yourself brain damage because you can't fix anyone else. And and Jesus once again models that. How do I support you and you support me? Jesus woke up the disciples who'd fallen asleep and said to them, "Can you just be with me? That's all we're supposed to do. Be with you." Now, as a professional counselor and 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 therapist and whatever. That you and I both are we trained to help people to do that to mm-hmm. be okay to help support people so but if you're not trained to fix no one can fix anyone no and I, I love that about your work and the work we do with trauma is because it's so important for clinicians if they're listening or helping professionals or pastors if you're yeah. not centered authentically in who you are and who God says that you are then you're also stunning the vibration and the and the love between the two people that you're trying to serve and connect with. So if I'm trying to do therapy with you or disciple you or love you and I'm in my pain and I'm in my mess, which I'm going to be sometimes, but the less messy I can be, the more together in our relationship we can clean these things up, you know, and the less likelihood I am going to damage you. Exactly. And that, sorry to interrupt you, but that no, less me, you talk about the less messy. It's, it's as long as you accept that it's okay to be messy in the first place because right. then you can get less messy because the messiness has to come first because yes. that's part of our intelligence development. It's a part of the fact that we can allow for your life and be blessing and curse and choose. Yeah, I always so say that, that if you want to move out of the victim seat, you have to acknowledge that you were a victim. You know, if, if something happened, you have to go back and go, hey, what happened to me that caused these things? Okay, that hurt. That wasn't supposed to be. That was not God's plan. That was not the Garden of Eden. And so, therefore, there are consequences that come with things not being how God wanted them to be. 
And now I have to take responsibility and move out of that victim seat. And, you know, it's like, you know, you bleed on people who didn't cut you, that quote. You know, it's like if I don't pay attention to the wound, if I don't put the, the right, you know, bandage on it, then I'm just bleeding all over the place, all around me on people who did not hurt me because I haven't, exactly. I haven't paid attention to where, who did. Exactly, exactly. I always flip the word responsibility because responsibility to say to someone, as you know yourself, who's hurting and who's been a victim because you can't learn a lesson from being a victim. Nope. You're raped, there's no to learn there's just space that's needed to heal mm -hmm. so you can conceptualize but if you if you say to flip that word responsibility and tell a person actually you have the ability to respond you know it's very different because it's not so threatening right. take responsibility is very judgmental and harsh but if you say hey you know you've actually got the ability to respond let me help you see that ability that's so ability good to respond responsibility that's just so much i tell myself that all the time it just makes things you know, it's not responsibility. I immediately feel pressure, but I have the ability to respond. Totally different. Well, it's so layered. I talk when we talk about accountability with my friends or my peers. I say that you know, it's not accountability as if I'm going to catch you. Oh, you didn't do your Bible study, or or you you know looked at pornography, or you cussed, or you yelled, or whatever. It's you have an. I'm going to take an account of your ability in Jesus, and in Jesus, you can do amazing things. You know, in Jesus, you can, you know, resurrect things, you can heal things, you can restore things. And so, yeah, it's not this harsh, we're judging you and criticizing you. We're loving you and supporting you and we believe in you and we think you have that ability. So, yeah, I love that. It's really, really good. Well, look, I know you're out of time. Um, I know you got plenty of other things to do. So I just want to thank you so much for your time. A day of interviews and a day of one, after, one thing after another and flights and all kinds of things, but I'm glad we managed to do this. And thank you for your great questions. And uh, we've been referencing, just as an aside, we've been referencing that there's a system. And maybe I should just yeah, go ahead. Tell if you got time, please. I, in a minute, basically, in this book, I have put a system that I developed over 38 years. So what I did with my patients is, it's not a technique; it's a system. Think of Amazon. Amazon is is a, whether you like Amazon or not, it's a great system. It works. You can deliver anything, anytime, anywhere. What I've tried to do is develop a system within which you can put all kinds of techniques and therapies and whatever it is that you have worked out. Because we're all pretty good at working out little things that help ourselves. Yeah. But if you don't get your mind working properly with your brain you're not going to get the neural wiring happening like it should so i've developed a concept called the neuro cycle which i explain in the second half of the book and how to do it and i have an app as well called the neuro cycle app where i'm literally giving you therapy walking you through it and that then is the system of literally how you bring a thought into captivity and renew your mind so it's the process of listening to the signals capturing the thought deconstructing it finding the root reconstructing it and stabilizing it and you'll see it works in cycles of 63 days because we don't make neural changes in 21 like most people think we will they have it in 21 it's a minimum of three cycles of 21 so you'll see the whole system has been designed around using the five steps of the neuro cycle daily over these cycles of, of 21 day, of, of 63 days three mm. cycles of but all of that's very clearly laid out in the book and the app is very popular um that also makes it super easy along with working along with the book because it's a book and then you've got the me literally giving therapy and now it doesn't take away from therapy it actually enhances therapy so when people use this you'll find much more proper activity in your counseling sessions so it really we encourage we have so many therapists around the world that are using the system in the in their practice we've got a certified facilitator a course where people can actually be um can be certified coming up early next year. Um, I ran it in South Africa, now we're setting it up to run in this country. But in the meantime, people can learn to manage their mind because they see you, Clint, once or twice a week, but they've got to live with themselves 24-7. Yeah. So if you don't, and your mind never stops 24-7, your mind never stops even for three seconds. So the neurocycle is a great system of mind management. It's a great system of how you, mind management simply is. Bring all thoughts to captivity and renew your mind. That's what I'm bringing the science of that into your hands to do daily that you can function more efficiently and then get more out of therapy and counseling. Absolutely. So, well, yeah, re listen, y'all check out her book. Um, cleaning up your mental mess is Dr. Caroline leaf and you can get so much good information in here. Um, she got plenty of other awesome books that I've listed in the front. I'll tag them. Um, I'll be sure to tag you, Dr. Leaf, to all of our podcast stuff. If you're listening, please subscribe and like. You can visit Dr. Leaf at her website. Um, she's got a Facebook page, Instagram page with a lot of great resources. I know a lot of my community follows you and, and follows your Facebook page and shares your posts and all those kind of things. So I just really appreciate it. Guys, um, thank you all so much, and God bless you.